So thanks, everyone, for joining us on a Sunday morning. I'm very um, happy and shocked to see so many of you so early on Sunday. Today's reading will be from Vue.java. <laughs> if you would please turn your AOSP prayer books to line 13,068. All right, so this is the history of Android. Uh, I've been on Android for about 10 years, actually 10 years now, exactly. Uh, and we want to go back and talk about every release of Android, every public release of Android. Of course, Android is a large team, so we're going to talk. We're going to give you anecdotes that are personal, and, and then we're could all be fictional as well. <laughs> and there's a lot more things we wish we could talk about, or we wish we could say, but we can't. Um, we like our jobs. We like our jobs. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we like our jobs. Uh, but you know, there, there are many other uh, women and men behind Android, so this does not cover everything. This is just a little sliver of Android. So it'd be nice to know the context for the people in the room. Uh, in particular, it'd be nice to know when you joined Android. I assume that everybody in the room is actually developing at least for Android O, or has been working on it since Android O. Otherwise, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> Let's say, who's been developing since Android N? Hands up. Okay, how about, way up, way up, come on, we gotta see him from the stage, the lights are so bright. How about M? Okay, L, I'm gonna have to walk backwards through the alphabet, this is gonna be tricky. K, Jelly Bean? I, I see hands going up and down, that makes no sense whatsoever. Like, no, 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 I skipped Jelly Bean, but then I came in between, I, no. I, I think they'll just tire them. Okay, all right, ICS, what's before I? Uh, honeycomb. Oh. <laughs> Okay, how about uh, uh, Gingerbread? Who is working on Android as of Gingerbread? How about Froyo? I was about to say Frodo. Oh. Uh, how That's about strange. Eclair? Ooh, getting down there. Donut? Cupcake? And who is working on it for 1.0? And before 1.0? Yeah, before 1.0, who is playing? Okay, we have three people in the room. All right, so the rest of you can tune out for the next few minutes. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, several sections in this talk. Uh, the first one is the prehistory. So that's before Android 1.0. So our first public release was called M3. Uh, I assume it's for Milestone 3. I have no idea what happened to 1 and 2. Uh, I'm sure they did exist at some point. Everybody uh, knows in software that you really don't pay attention until the third release, so I assume that was the dynamic era. It's like, well, let's just start on 3. All right, so at the bottom we have the full timeline of Android. Every, blue, uh, every big dot is gonna be uh, a major release, and then we're gonna have uh, other dots that show you the minor releases like 1.5, 1.6, and they will give you an idea, it's at scale, so they will give you an idea of how often we were releasing new versions of Android back then. Uh, things have changed. So the first, ver the first public release was uh, released on November 12th, uh, 2007. So sometime in a week from now, uh, it would have been 10 years. But before we released that SDK, so there was uh, a press release, um, and Google got together with other partners and said, we have this grand vision for a platform that all partners and ecosystem in the entire galaxy can benefit from. And then there were some choice quotes by other people in the industry. Uh, first of all, there was this person who worked at some company in Symbian something. Search and a mobile phone platform are completely different things. It's a costly, arduous, and at times deeply unsexy job, true, of supporting customers day by day in launching phones. They are talking about having a phone by the end of next year. It's not one that is going to ignite developers. And then there was uh, another quote on the next day. So we had this press release a couple days later. These things come out. I believe this person was an engineering manager up in Washington. <laughs> Their efforts are just some words on paper. Right now, they have a press release. That's true. true. We have many, many millions of customers. True. Great software. Sure. <laughs> many hardware devices. Also true. OK. So that was the press release and the, uh, the responses to it. Um, it turns out that, yes, there was a press release. There was also bits ready to ship. Um, Android has a history of having a little bit of fun, inside at least, uh, and they thought, well, instead of just releasing the bits, why don't we actually get some word out there, get a little bit of buzz, and then we'll come out with it. So one week later, SDK was actually released. So the entire industry thought, nice try. 
Obviously, vaporware, they're just trying to generate some noise. No, actually, it was ready to go out the door. They just kind of had a little fun with it in the meantime. Now, we did release something, and this was it. Uh, the M3 release, that's uh, screenshots of the emulator. If you're curious, you can find the emulator, the whole SDK. They're still online, so you have to look for Android SDK archives. Uh, they're a little bit difficult to run on today's uh, laptops, but they still run. Um, you can see the, the device frame here uh, is what we call the Sooner. So that was the hardware device, the hardware we were using internally to write the code. So that was originally a phone by HTC running Windows Mobile, and we're using it as our, as our development platform, waiting for our first uh, real devices, the T-Mobile G1. They were not quite ready to be used by the engineers. What's interesting is already back then, uh, most of the core features of Android were there. So we had notifications, intent, activities, content providers, we had the home button, the back button. We had the menu button that turned into recent, so that's, that's gone. Uh, and also, because we didn't want to, to play our cards, we have this uh, little X button here uh, on the device. Uh, it was actually a search button. Uh, for some reason, we thought that you know, it would be a big secret uh, for Google to, to really search. Uh, so we're hiding it in the, in, in the public SDK. Uh, the, f the UI, the software itself, well, it had a UI. It was interesting. Um, but it did run pretty well. We still have some of those devices at work. Uh, they still boot, they still run. Uh, there was a single core CPU. We didn't have much RAM. There was an 80 megahertz CPU. Everything was done in software. We did not have a GPU. But it runs really smoothly because of the resolution. And speaking of resolution, so this is a Pixel XL, so the phone we released last year, that's a screenshot. And just as a comparison, I'm gonna overlay a screenshot of the Sooner on top, and we're gonna bring it to scale, just to give you an idea of how far we've come. <laughs> so the performance on the platform was really quite admirable at the time. It turns out that you can do things pretty fast if there's only four pixels to fill. Right. <laughs> so we had an entire phone and an entire OS to draw a launcher icon. <laughs> so shortly after we had a, a new build of M3, uh, we introduced a new form factor, our vertical phone. Uh, it still pretended to not be a touchscreen device, but that was the device we were working on that became the T-Mobile G1. So we had a new resolution that was 320 by 480. Not much had changed. The UI is still uh, there. Yeah, still there. Uh, and as we were going through the release notes of the SDK, we found a lot of interesting things, because the APIs were changing a lot. We were trying to figure out what we should keep, what we should not keep. So I found this one that I found interesting. So android.text.layout.directions. And if you look at the Java doc, it says stores information about bidirectional text within the layout of a line. And there's this beautiful to-do. This work is not complete or correct, and will be fleshed out in a later revision. That later revision was Android 4.1. <laughs> it, yeah, it should have been an eventually, not a to-do. Language is hard. They're still working on Esperanto. Uh, so to give a little context, we'll have these sort of interstitial slides occasionally to tell you what else is going on in the industry. In 2008, in February, Microsoft acquires Danger. The reason that's interesting is because um, some of the people involved in Danger, I believe Andy Rubin was a founder of Danger, yeah. um, and those people had since obviously moved on to Android and Google, but Microsoft acquired Danger at that point. Um, also in Redmond, uh, oh, yeah, 500 million. There you go. Money well spent. So just a few months later, uh, we released M5, uh, which again, I assume means Milestone 5. I don't know what happened to Milestone 4. Uh, we have a bad habit on Android. We're bad at naming or even numbering. It could have been a floating point round off error. <laughs> Most likely. Um, the, big new, the big new feature in this release was the window shade uh, that we still use to this day. So here's what the UI looked like. Uh, pretty different. Uh, it's still a UI. Uh, we used to call it the Play School UI. It had a lot of interesting colors. Uh, and my favorite, and I think Chet loves those as well, the, the icons, you can see they're slanted. Uh, we believe they're trying to run away from that UI. <laughs> uh, also, you'll notice um, there's a recurring theme uh, as we go through stuff that assets and UX are really hard. Uh, as you'll witness, it's really difficult to center that pink X in the middle of the area. <laughs> 
I'm pretty sure anybody who tried to center text before knows that it is actually difficult. Uh, one thing that was not great about this uh, early UI is you can see it a little bit in the background of this notification. We had a lot of bending and artifacts because we're using that format, that pixel format called 565, where we have five bits of, five bits of precision for uh, red and blue and six bits for green. We eventually got rid of it. Uh, but it looked terrible in gradients because we would see like greenish hues because green had more had more precision. Uh, Actually, uh, it's worth pointing out that I remember you working a lot on gradients during honeycomb, right? And also during O. Right. So this continues to be something that we have taken a, a whack at over the years. No, actually, my job for the past ten years has been to work on gradients. That's all I do. <laughs> They're hard. Uh, another six months later, Android 0 0.9. So we're, we're very close to 1.0, and you can see already what look like. Uh, it's very similar to the final UI. It's worth uh, pointing out that we were pretty bad at assets back then. So if you look at the clock over there, if you look at the bottom shadow, it's clipped. Uh, yeah, apparently one of the designers in Photoshop did not realize that the, you, know, you need more space for the shadow. And nobody noticed when we put it in the build. Uh, we're, better, we're better at it these days. Assets are hard. My favorite bit here is the dim window that you'll see in the middle. So we still have a dim window. If you pop something up on top, you have the ability to dim out everything behind it. It's a good UX experience. You, you defocus on the stuff behind so that you focus the user's attention on the foreground stuff. Um, the difference today versus what they were doing then was you can see the stuff behind is actually blurred. They decided before 1.0 went out that the dim window shouldn't blur automatically because although it worked well on that specific device, um, it wasn't necessarily going to work well on every device. And in fact, that's true today. If you do a blurring operation on random device with random mobile GPU, it won't necessarily perform well, which is why we still don't make it possible uh, by default in the, in the dim window to do that because you're just going to bring the machine to a crawl. Some noteworthy features. If you look at the launcher, it looks very similar to what we have today. So we had our first widget, uh, the clock, and I think we had a search bar. Those were built in. Applications could not install their own widgets. We could finally add shortcuts to the workspace. You had multiple workspaces you could scroll through. I think there was a limit to maybe three. Uh, and we had the app drawer at the bottom. Um, interestingly, back then, we were creating a new launcher almost every week, trying to figure out you know, what it should be. Uh, I was working on that with, uh, with my manager. Uh, and UX always had those crazy ideas. I mean, they sounded really cool. For instance, they wanted that when you swipe between two workspaces on launcher, they should be motion blur. And I remember being in a meeting with them, and I see the animation, I'm like, okay, guys, you know, this is great. Uh, you're showing me that on the Mac Pro running After Effects. How long did it take to render that? They're like, oh, it took about you know, 30 minutes. And you want that running real time on a phone, on a T-Mobile G1. Um, so we did not do that. Um, we also switched to green. Um, my bet is because of the bending and dithering from that 565 format. Uh, that hides the problem a little bit. But speaking of assets. Uh, so as we pointed out a couple of times, assets are hard. You will notice that the icon for search looks remarkably similar to the icon for picture frame. Um, there are designers uh, on Android. There were back then and there are now. But sometimes it's just easier to copy and paste instead. It would be nice. If we could say this is the way that we did things back then, but we've gotten much more professional since. It was probably in the ICS release when I was writing some uh, developer tool for ADT uh, for dumping the display list. And I thought, well, I could ask for a new icon, but it's not really worth it for this tool. So I'll just grab this other one and stick it in place. And there it was. And those are actually my fault. Uh, the Android team was very small back then. Uh, to give you an idea, I was in charge of writing the launcher application, but I was also writing uh, part of, parts of the UI toolkit, the rendering pipeline, and some of the tools. So we had a lot to do. Uh, some other interesting tidbits about those first versions, so the animations, the old animation system, the android.view.animation, uh, were always off by one frame. Uh, that was a little weird, and the code inside is still a little odd and difficult to maintain. Uh, that was done on purpose. So the way the old animation system works is that it's driven by the render loop. So when we call the draw method of a, of a view, we look at the current time, uh, we ask the animation what are the values for now, and we can, we can draw the, the view like with the new alpha or the new scale or whatever. The problem is when we need to draw the next frame. So the animation interface tells us that the animation wants to draw more, but because we don't know when the next frame is going to be, the only thing we can do is invalidate the entire parent. That was extremely wasteful, especially on the slow devices of the, you know, from 10 years ago. So the horrible hack I implemented shortly before we shipped was to ignore the first frame of the animation, 
remember where we should have been, uh, and then on the next frame, apply the previous frame, and that way we could invalidate only the, the right part of the screen. So now we have this horrible code in the draw method. You can go look in AOSP. It says something like, if, you know, uh, end of the animation, one more equals true, and then we, have, we go for one more time, because we have to catch that last frame. And around Honeycomb, someone on the team saw that code and thought it was useless, and just removed it in a, <laughs> in a code review. And I'm glad I caught it because you know, his comment was something like, well, oh, this looks useless, I'm just gonna get rid of it. I'm like, whoa, 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 no, there's a good reason. Um, so we have a lot of you know, kind of horrible things in the code base in a few places. Uh, usually there's always a good reason for them. There's a cheesy magic trick that I learned, I think, when I was eight years old for uh, some mind reading trick. And the trick works on the basis of you reading the thing that you're gonna do next as part of answering the previous question. Stupid trick, most people could see through it immediately. That was basically what he implemented, was an eight-year-old magic trick uh, inside the platform. And we fooled everybody. Yes. Um, but it still works that way. So if you haven't taken the opportunity to stop using the old animation system, it's about time. Uh, another interesting tidbit about on save and on restore instance state uh, that I'm sure you've all used. Sometimes in the samples or the documentation, the parameter is called the icicle. It's because those two methods used to be called on thaw and on free, so that was just a horrible pun that we had put in the API. Or it was well thought out. <laughs> Chet, what, what did we say about this kind of jokes? 500 people groan all at the same time. Right. That was awesome. Um, and yeah, because again, back then, like just before we were about to ship 1.0, we were scrambling to to fix our APIs to remove what shouldn't be there and to tweak uh, what we wanted to keep and make it a little better. And I think on save instance state is probably a better name than on thaw. Um, going through the release notes, I found this, uh, this hardware acceleration. Apparently, I had implemented hardware acceleration way back then and I'd completely forgotten about it. Uh, so it was an opt-in feature. Um, you could turn it on in your application. It would make your application run on top of OpenGL instead of our software render. I even found the some of the code. Uh, we ended up removing it from the build because we had OpenGL ES1 that doesn't have shaders and that would have made some features of Canvas either extremely difficult or pretty much impossible to implement. So instead of trying to ship something that you know, was half broken, uh, we decided to just take it out. And we would eventually implement it in Honeycomb. And speaking of APIs, APIs are difficult. I think of APIs as uh, designing future regret. There is no API that I've ever created that I haven't years later looked back at and thought, to if be, only I had known then what I know now. To be clear, everybody who used your APIs also regret them. <laughs> <laughs> we try really hard to envision everything that's gonna happen and it's basically impossible to do so. So you do what you can at the time, you ship them, and then you regret later. Um, there were some abilities before 1.0 went out to actually remove stuff from the API that shouldn't have been there. So we did remove some of the APIs that didn't make sense. So view.copy window bitmap, that was handy. You could take a screenshot of the window. Why it was on view, I don't know. It makes no sense, we got rid of it. We had the ticker, uh, which was basically the marquee tag from HTML, uh, pretty useless. Uh, and we had, uh, that, that one's my favorite, the page turner. So at some point, the calculator app used this uh, skeuomorphic design. It looked like one of those old calculators that uses uh, paper tape. Um, so when you do your computations, it just prints them on a little roll of paper. And when you press the clear button, there was this beautiful animation where the, the paper would be torn off the screen. That was great. Uh, having that as a widget in the framework, maybe not that useful. Uh, if, if any of you need that widget today, please come talk to me. We can, <laughs> we can figure something out, but you know. It's, um, it, to me, it's kind of the difference between writing an app um, or doing a utility library out in the wide world versus doing an API for a platform. Right? That widget, it, it's not that it shouldn't have been done or that that experience shouldn't have been there, but it didn't need to be one of the core widgets in our API simply because most people are never going to need something like that or probably shouldn't use something like that. Uh, and in the meantime, it just sort of clutters the API and distracts from the stuff that developers actually do need. But don't worry, there's plenty of uh, bad APIs that we've kept. Oh, yay. Uh, yeah, so for example, absolute layout. Who's still using that? <laughs> Someone tried to raise their hand. Come hands. talk to me at the end. <laughs> um, no, no, no excuse, come talk to me. Uh, so WebView uh, apparently yeah. is still a user of that. And in fact, they did try hard to get away from it, but um, backward compatibility. 
So uh, we also have Zoom button. Uh, we are still deprecating. We can't remove anymore because we don't want to break the apps that may have mistakenly used these horrible APIs. Um, during the O release, I was poking around some APIs and found this thing called Zoom button, which is neither a button nor does it Zoom. <laughs> but at some point, it was a button and it did Zoom. Just like Spinner doesn't spin. But it did spin at some point. <laughs> Uh, in M3, before we had the touch implementation, it was actually a spinner, and now it's a combo box. Uh, and I'm sure it's super confusing for people who, uh, who learn Android, you know, if you're fresh out of school, you're looking for your combo box, and you have to ask someone because it's called the spinner. We also have kept uh, the two-line list item. Um, it's, it was a utility class so that in a list view you could put two lines of text, because apparently it's really difficult to do yourself, so you know, and the Android team being the helpful people that we are, we gave you that class. Uh, but the best part is when you look at the documentation, uh, it supports two lines of text and optionally a third one. So it's not the two line list item, it's like the two-ish list item. So we should have just named it better. Instead of two item list, it should have been two, maybe three item list, and then it would have made more sense. So finally, our early years. So Android 1.0 was released on September 23rd, 2008. And our first phone was the T-Mobile G1. Uh, it was actually launched very, uh, very close from here. Um, I used to live on Fifth and Market, so a few blocks away. And uh, the launch event took place at a T-Mobile store on Market Street. Um, so yeah, just a few, min a few minutes walk from here, we had our first customer buying the G1. That was kind of a, was kind of a fun moment to see to be there and you know, see someone who actually buys your stuff. Uh, I didn't ask him if he was happy about it. I assume he was. So I knew Roma at the time. I knew how hard he was working on everything. They did like parallel releases for years, just sort of heads down working all evenings, weekends, um, uh, just stuff, just work all the time. Sleep came years later. Um, and I'm pretty sure they did it at the store near his apartment so that he could go back to work after the launch event. That would not surprise me. Um, so not very different from 0 0.9. We did fix the shadow on the clock, which was good. Uh, we had, so our first device could go to landscape. You had to reveal the hardware keyboard to do that. We did not have a software keyboard. We had a trackball, uh, which would later be, be removed. And the device was pretty powerful by the, by the standards back then. So we had 192 megs of RAM. It was a 300 megahertz CPU. We had a GPU. It was a really, really nice device. And again, most of the features that you know and love uh, today were, were available back there. So we had the lock pattern on the lock screen. We had support for the, the resolution independence with the DIP or DP unit. Uh, we had multitasking, you know, restore and safe state, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, yeah, one fun thing about the, the G1 is we were trying really hard to fit the system in the, the amount of RAM we had because, you know, we had 192 megs. But some of it has to be reserved for the kernel. Some of it has to be reserved for the radio so you can receive phone calls. And in the end, we had about 32 or 48 megs left for the system plus the apps. Uh, and then one day, one of our kernel engineers just found an extra 32 megs of RAM in the device. Uh, he had just been hiding it from us because he did not trust uh, the framework team and the apps team uh, with RAM usage. So it, it's important noting what Romain was talking about, about so much of the system already being there. The thing I believe that has helped Android succeed over the years and all these other releases and different releases on different form factors all throughout the world, none of which we can really predict at any point in time, is that so much was built in from the beginning. So if you were not making the mistake of using absolute layout, for example, and you were using one of the more powerful and flexible layouts on the system, applications that you were writing for the system at that time should basically work today, at least architecturally, they, they should actually behave in today's world. So when we introduce things like multi-window or display size settings that actually change uh, the, the density or the size of the screen your application is running in, things just work. So there was a lot of forethought given to the platform so that it wasn't like most phone manufacturers in the world at that point were releasing devices. Like this system is for this device and this specific form factor there and everything was kind of baked in and then a new device or a new form factor would come out and they would need to add to it or come out with a different system or whatever as opposed to Android building in all those platform capabilities so that the platform could carry forward into devices that we couldn't even imagine at that time. And performance was paramount. Uh, because we had so little RAM, we could not keep many applications in memory. And Launcher, for instance, would get killed pretty often. So the target I was given was a cold start of Launcher should be 500 milliseconds. Uh, I don't know if your app can start in 500 milliseconds today, but it's pretty difficult to, uh, to achieve that number. 
Uh, Android market, uh, was we released it with Android 1.0. Um, we only had three applications. Um, there was a, a, a slot for the price, but apparently payment, payments are hard, so you could only <laughs> download everything for free. Uh, but you can see that market hasn't changed that much. Uh, we had the categories, you could see the ratings, we had comments, uh, you could see the list of permissions before you installed an application. And more importantly, uh, the next month, we released the source code of Android. So that's something we've always done. We release a new version of Android, and then shortly after, we drop the, the, the source code in AOSP. Uh, it was exciting. Uh, I love working on an, on an open source project. It was also a little bit worrying at times because after the source code appeared, a lot of companies started using Android to do things that we had not necessarily planned for. Um, so every year you would see those uh, hardware shows like the CES in Las Vegas where people would put Android in cars and ovens and fridges. And knowing how, you know, some of the code I wrote, I'm like, please don't put that in an oven. <laughs> As, as far as I know, nothing bad ever happened, uh, but, you know, uh, and things are better today now. We officially support Android Auto, Android TV, Android Things. Um, it was interesting to see all those companies doing so many uh, great things with Android that were not phones. A uh, couple months, uh, three months later, uh, in February, our first update, Android 1.1, our first system OTA called Petit Four. Uh, the name was chosen to indicate that it was a small release, um, but we added a bunch of, eight, of features. So we, have, we had voice search, we had latitude. So latitude is location sharing. It used to be its own application, it moved to maps, then it was in G+. Yes. Now I think it's back in maps. Uh, you know, it keeps the engineering teams busy, just so moving things around. The most important thing about location-based software is hiding it, so you can't find out where it is, right? It's just kind of a play on the whole concept. <laughs> And two months later, our first name released, Android 1.5 or Cupcake. So the big question, why C? Uh, we had a couple of uh, releases internally, starting with A and B. They were called Astro Boy and Bender, so they were named after uh, robots. Uh, and after Petit Four, and also because it would probably be difficult to find a name uh, for every letter of the alphabet using robots, uh, we switched to desserts, uh, which doesn't make sense when you're called Android, uh, but I like it a lot better. That's uh, the phone we shipped with Android 1.5. That was the HTC Magic. Uh, that was our first phone without a hardware keyboard, so we had the introduction of the software keyboard. It had a sensor to handle auto-rotation of the screen. And interestingly, so you know how at Google we like to ship new messaging applications? Uh, it's just got, it's a hobby. Yeah, it's a, it's a hobby. But it's a hobby that dates way, way back. Because when we shipped Android 1.0, we had Gmail, email, uh, SMS, which was called messaging, I think, and we had the uh, IM application, which handled uh, Live Messenger, Yahoo Messenger, uh, Gtalk, and AIM. In 1.5, instead of having only four messaging applications, we decided to have five. So we took Gtalk out of the IM application and gave it its own application. So nothing new, it's something we've always done, and we'll probably keep doing it. So Maps came out uh, in 2009 on market. This was an important precedent for where we were going in the future. Prior to that, this, all the main applications that you think of as sort of core Android system were bundled with system image. So you would get an update or you would get a device that had that release and then you would get those versions of those applications. Now Maps and then eventually all the other applications that are sort of core to the experience were unbundled and available on market, updatable out of band, no longer locked to the system image itself. And many months later, Android 1.6 called Donut. Um, the big new feature of Donut was the support of the CDMA network. So the CDMA network was what Verizon was using in the US back then, which was a huge deal for Android because Verizon was, and I think still is, the number one provider in, in, in North America. So it opened uh, the Android market to a lot more users. Uh, we also finished uh, the work we had started in, in 1.0 and 1.5, which is support for multiple screen sizes. We, we added uh, better compatibility support. We fixed a few bugs in the, the density resolution. Uh, but it was a pretty small update, uh, and yet it, it, it appeared six months after 1.5. And the reason is not that we were slacking off. Uh, there was another reason, and we'll talk about it in a minute. But first, another hobby of ours. Uh, redesigning market. So, uh, 
market rewrote itself. Now they have white background instead of black. Um, this is also an important precedent where basically every few months they would rewrite the UI of market. Uh, I believe it continues to this day. Um, all of those changes I think were good. Not only was the UI changing, but the experience, the usability of it, the search capabilities, there were radical things that they needed to do to make it a more usable application, and so they keep doing that thing. But you can see that now the applications can have a price, and you can actually make money Whoa. from your application. Whoa. We thought that might be useful to web developers. Well, 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 well let's, let's be clear. You said we could make money. You could make money. That's, no, that's the important yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. OK. All right. <laughs> All right, so that was in September. And in October, we released Android 2.0, or Eclair, um, which doesn't make any sense. So what happened was we finished 2.0 before 1.6. Again, round off error. And we kind of worked on both at the same time. Uh, that would not be the last time. Um, hopefully, we, we start doing that, which is great. Uh, I enjoy having a, a life and sleep uh, nowadays. Um, Yes, and we shipped Android 2.0 with the Motorola Droid. That was our first uh, phone, big phone on Verizon uh, using the Droid brand. Uh, we went back to a hardware keyboard, and I think someone really liked old calculators, because if you look at the D-pad in the bottom right, it looks like something from the 70s. Uh, and the Droid came with this really weird advertisement campaign. It was about like, aliens coming from space and invading Earth, and it turned out to be Droid phones. Uh, I'm not sure why that was supposed to be a good thing, but apparently people liked it. Uh, it was a pretty big success. I uh, assume that marketing was trying to scare people into buying phones, which apparently worked. And that was our first HDPI screen. If I remember correctly, the resolution was 800 by 480. Uh, so you, there was finally time to use those uh, dash HDPI qualifiers. We also introduced turn-by-turn -turn navigation in Google Maps. Shortly after. Nexus devices. So Nexus came along as something that I think is wise for us to uh, have done from the beginning, which is we're developing a platform. The platform should work with new functionality, existing functionality. It should be supportable on and devices that we can envision or that we hope that our partners will build. Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually prove out those concepts with hardware in parallel with the release so that we don't come out with the platform and then we get feedback from you know, partners or whoever that actually we need you know, different APIs or capabilities to support this stuff. So that was the idea, uh, at least partially behind the Nexus program, was that we would have essentially these reference devices. Some have been more premium, some not as much. Uh, but the idea was mostly not to get all of these devices out in the world, but rather to have a solid device um, that we could depend on to develop the platform in parallel with. And 2.1 was still called Eclair because I assume it's annoying to find a new name, so why bother? <laughs> Uh, we shipped it with the Nexus One. Uh, the Nexus One is interesting. We still had the trackball, but you can see that the buttons at the bottom were not, uh, they were still hardware buttons, but they, they were not uh, push buttons. They were, that was a small capacitive screen, effectively. So that was the start of what took many, many years, which is to get rid of the physical buttons except power and volume. Uh, this is still, it, it's a great phone. Uh, it's interesting because I remember when it came out, it felt so big. It was a 3.3 and a half inch screen. And when Huge. you see it today, it's so tiny and cute. You could put it in a short pocket. It was also the introduction of live wallpapers. Uh, so to implement live wallpapers, we used this thing called RenderScript. Um, it, was a, it was a hidden API in Naturalist because it was not quite ready for prime time. Uh, to give you an idea of how not ready it was, so I worked on the live wallpapers because Andy Rubin one day showed up in my office and asked uh, Diane, Joe, and myself, hey, I want live wallpapers. We're shipping in five weeks. Could you please design and implement 10 live wallpapers and also a framework and an API that people could use? Like, sure, why not? We have nothing else to do. Let's do this. Um, so we did the prototyping on the desktop. I'll, sh I'll show you an example. Uh, but yeah, so I was using this, uh, this, uh, this thing called RenderScript. And when you had a syntax error in your source file, and some of the live wallpapers were pretty big, like, you know, a thousand lines of code or so, all you would get in Logcat was a dump of the CPU registers. And that was it. So I, had, I spent a few interesting evenings uh, at work with that. Uh, we also had a 3D launcher. Like, the, the list of all apps was mapped for some reason on a 3D object. Uh, that did not survive for very long. It was kind of cool, but ultimately useless. Um, so here are a couple of examples of our live wallpapers. So those are the actual prototypes I used back then. I used something called processing. Um, that you can, if, if you're interested, you can go on processing.org. It's, a, it's a, a language that's meant to do uh, art or drawing or you know, stuff like that. So here you can see the Galaxy live wallpaper. 
Uh, this one is interesting because we, we simulate, it's something like 12,000 or 15,000 particles uh, rotating to simulate a galaxy. And I wanted to show you that when you do graphics, if it looks right, then it is right, but it's never right. So here's how the galaxy is built. Uh, there's a texture in the background and then we just put the, the dots on top. It's in 3D, but not really. <laughs> Looks convincing enough though. If you ever wake up in the morning and you're just feeling kind of flat, it's because we are. <laughs> Another one was the grass demo. Um, so this one uses the uh, GPS location to figure out where you are on the planet. It computes the sunrise and the sunset. Uh, and this is a sped up version, but it, the, um, the background changes, so you're gonna see your sunset and sunrise, and at night you're gonna see the nighttime. We have blades of grass swaying in the wind, uh, and you, you can admire the performance um, here running on my brand new MacBook Pro, uh, super expensive machine. This is not, this, yeah, this is the kind of performance I was getting with processing, so maybe I was doing something wrong, but this is why we went with render script instead of processing on, on the phones. Um, which is funny because, yeah, back then it also ran it was also running really badly, so I don't know why it's not more performant. But. Consistency. I will see. Meanwhile, Palo Alto and Sunnyvale, HP acquires Palm for a billion dollars. Android 2.2 in May 2010, uh, that was Froyo, uh, and more importantly, that's when Chet joined the team. Yay, that's Wait, what everybody that wanted thing? to hear about, right? <laughs> <laughs> so when I joined, um, Gingerbread was fully underway, uh, but I focus primarily on Honeycomb because I joined specifically to work on uh, animation stuff uh, and I was letting everybody else get on with their actual job of getting gingerbread out the door. So uh, other things that were happening, let's see, on that release, uh, we had Flash capability. Um, Flash, and I was coming from Adobe at the time and we all knew that Flash was the future of the web, so that was useful. <laughs> Uh, there was a JIT for Dalvik. So Dalvik up until that point had been interpreted, which was awesome, but not quite awesome enough. Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually optimize the code and run it at machine speeds instead of interpreted speeds? Uh, at that time, we had uh, V8 in the browser um, and interesting bundled apps from uh, Twitter. Did we do the Twitter app? I think we did. Uh, as well as the goggles app. Uh, because QR codes are obviously prevalent throughout well, society. Goggles were more than QR codes. Uh, so we recently announced Google Lens, which is basically AR and recognition. Well, we had goggles years ago that was doing effectively the same thing. Not as well, of course, uh, but it disappeared. Now it's coming back because I guess AR is fashionable. There are no new ideas in software. No. Yeah, our industry is a giant scam. We keep going from company to company, building the same things over and over again. Especially, Chet, how many animation frameworks have you built in, at how many companies? N. <laughs> right. Uh, meanwhile, up in Washington uh, in 2010, there was the release of the Windows Phone 7. And we reached the end of 2010 with Gingerbread. Uh, we say it's too good to die because I'm sure a lot of you had to support Gingerbread for way too long. Who still supports Gingerbread in their applications? <sighs> I, okay. So, yeah. I have to move on. And, you know, we need to apologize because that release was so good that OEMs kept shipping it, so we promise we're never gonna do a release that good ever again. <laughs> it came out with the Nexus S. Uh, that phone was, uh, had a 512 megs of RAM. The trackball was finally gone, so one step forward, uh, one step toward removing all the hardware buttons. Uh, there was a big refresh of the UI. The, big, the biggest change for me is that we finally dropped the 565 format. We went to 8888, uh, and a lot of developers were mad at me for that. Uh, we had, uh, what did we had? Oh yeah, we, we switched the theme, and you can, we went from something that was orange to green, uh, but as would be another hobby of ours, in some places we would keep the orange. Uh, <laughs> Not quite finished yet. Just didn't find it there. You'll also notice on the right-hand side, you see the overscroll effect, the fading thing there. Um, that eventually changed to a grayscale fading effect, which eventually changed to a large circular radius thing, uh, which in the latest release changed to a slightly smaller circular radius thing. It's just another one of our hobbies. But while we were working on gingerbread, we were also working on a different uh, beast. So that's our limbo period and that's Honeycomb. So Honeycomb came out a couple months after Gingerbread. So again, we did not take only two months to build Honeycomb. We're working on both at the same time. Uh, and Honeycomb came uh, with our first Android tablet, the Motorola Zoom. Who no no more hardware buttons. Who owned a Zoom? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 
It was our first 720p display. It had this brand new, new UI, the, the whole UI, which gave birth later on to material design. Uh, you can see that we switched to blue, uh, but we left a bit of green. <laughs> we, can't, we can never really let go of the past. There was a big focus on getting rid of all those buttons. We, you've seen this over the years anyway, going from hardware to capacitive buttons and, and further and further. And, and Honeycomb is a release where the UX department really tried hard to get away from as many of the buttons as possible, including on the Zoom tablet, in particular the power button. It was really hard to find it. It was in the back. Yeah, buried way back there in an odd place. Uh, we had a lot of new APIs. We had the action bar. We had a new animation system, <laughs> which fixed a lot of the problems of the old animation system. Uh, actually, when I, one of the first things I did when I joined Android in 2007 was to file a bug saying, we need to rewrite the animation system to be property-based. Uh, and then in the grand split of Android, several years later, <laughs> someone finally did that. That's why I hired Chet, really. So the first week I got there, I got a bug reassigned to me, which was the bug filed, what, three years prior to that. So the big, the big change in the animation system, not just the new APIs, but also the properties that they depended on. Um, one hack about the old animation system was what Roman talked about earlier, uh, the sort of delayed by a frame effect. Um, but the other, the bigger hack to me was we weren't actually changing things on, on the screen. We weren't changing the objects. So if you wanted to move a button from the left to the right, you didn't actually move the button. You moved where the button was being drawn, which meant you could move it to the right, but you still had to press on the left for it to actually click. It confused more than one developer or user. Uh, we also introduced fragments. And the hardware acceleration. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so hardware acceleration was an opt-in. Uh, when we started working on the Zoom, we were still using our software renderer. But the problem is with that 720p display, we did not have enough bandwidth uh, to render everything at 60 frames per second. I think, actually, we did not even have enough bandwidth to draw the background of the applications. Uh, so I started working on the, the hardware accelerated code path. Uh, it, was in, it was fun to learn C++ and OpenGL and, you know, in three months before shipping. I, all he had to do was copy and paste the code that he written before 1.0 anyway. So right, that was, was exactly the same thing. Yeah. Uh, what, so we, we were working really hard on this and Chet helped a lot with the, the text uh, renderer, for instance. And there's one, we could not quite get the performance we wanted, like as hard as we would try, we were not getting 60 frames per second on screen. Until one day, I don't know what, why I tried that, but the Zoom had an HDMI output. So I plugged my Zoom uh, into a TV, and then there on the TV, it was beautifully smooth. Everything was so fast. Uh, then we asked Motorola what was up with that. Uh, turns out that the display uh, cannot change the color of the pixels at more than really 25 frames per second. Uh, it's actually even worse than that. Different colors will update at different speeds. So when you would swipe an image, you know, or, along the screen horizontally, you would see like this ghost trail of pixels, like following it, trying desperately to catch up, but could never quite catch up. We called it hardware-assisted motion blur. <laughs> and since the colors all animated at different rates, what you actually got was kind of a Doppler effect in RGB space. <laughs> to be clear, it was not a real feature. Uh, also, something interesting that happened back then, uh, just to give you an idea of like how much we had, we still had to build. We're still working on the very foundations of the OS. It's not true anymore today. Uh, we're a lot more professional. Um, sure. So we shipped in February, and you know, but December, I remember uh, our director came to me and said, "Hey, you know, performance is good, but it would be nice if it was even better. Like, do you have any idea of what else we could do?" So at the time, the Canvas API was what we call an immediate uh, mode API. So when you call draw line, it draws that line right now, uh, right there on the screen directly. Uh, another way of doing graphics is to use a, the deferred rendering mode, where you record all the commands, and then when you're ready, you just send them to the GPU all at once. It's much more efficient. But because the Android API was built to be immediate, that was really risky. Uh, so I told him, yes, you know, we could build a different mode, but we're shipping in two months. Uh, that's a little scary. Maybe we shouldn't do that. So we decided, yeah, you know what? We're not going to do this now. We're going to do it in the next release. So two weeks before the release, uh, he comes back to me and says, so this idea you had two months ago, how about we do it? <laughs> so Chet and I spent two painful, very painful weeks. Uh, I was still writing code a few hours before going to factory. Uh, but it worked. I don't know how, but it did work. 
I had come from companies and platforms where you basically freeze the software six to nine months in advance, and then only critical bugs get fixed up the release, because obviously this is how you build quality software. You go through testing cycles. You only fix the bugs that you have to. You don't introduce risk. This was my introduction to Android. We just compressed it a little bit. Uh, my best metaphor is, I don't know if you remember that stupid movie, Hot Shots, uh, but the father of the hero, they're trying to land their plane and they've been shot down, so their, their wing is coming apart. So he's climbing on the wing with a stapler and he's trying to staple the wing back while they're trying to land. That was us landing that release. <laughs> we made it. Yeah, it works, no problem. Uh, 3.1 and 3.2, a bunch of interesting uh, new APIs. So that was the introduction of the view property animator on view. Uh, that I think is my favorite API on Android. Uh, you still can, regrets. Still regrets. Still regrets, better. but yeah. still my favorite. Uh, resizable widgets. Uh, and you can see here uh, the recent menu now had screenshots. And you can see that beautiful blue glow that I love to uh, call the dead smurf. It looks like you take a smurf, you splash it on the screen, and you wrap it around. <laughs> Which could be the best thing to happen to smurfs. <laughs> yeah, that effect is gone. Uh, Spore library is introduced, um, so it was clear that some people would need uh, fragment capability on other releases, so why don't we backport that code, sort of fork this, put it in the Spore library so that people could use it across earlier releases as well. The most important thing about that was not the specific thing that was supported, but rather the precedent that now we had a way to introduce this statically compiled code that could mirror what we were trying to do in the platform, either in some backward compatible way, or stubs that you could call, or utility libraries, or whatever, so we would build on on that more and more in the future. And more importantly, the source code was not released. Uh, we've read a lot of things about this uh, online, lots of conspiracy theories that you know we had a bunch of hacks that it couldn't work on phones. There was none of that. There was this huge UI change, and we we're so focused on tablets, you know, the introduction of the, the, the two panel UIs, a uh, bunch of new widgets, a bunch of new themes. So the, the code in the platform itself is just fine and can run off on phones totally fine, but we did not have a UI. We did not build the layouts, we did not build the assets to be on phones. So we wanted to avoid effective fragmentation because if we release the source code as is, maybe people would start shipping it on phones and the experience would not be what we wanted it to be. So we did not release the source code. And I, I'm pretty sure that if you go to the OSP mirror today, uh, you will see all the history of the source code, the honeycomb tags are there, and you can check for yourself. But you know, there's nothing interesting uh, to see that, that release. You know, in English, the H is usually silent. So. The modern era, uh, at the end of 2011, there was a lot of hard work to bring Holo back to phones, which again is why we did not ship the source. Uh, and that was a big change for us because we had this more unified and modern UI. More interestingly, uh, we, that's when we start having numbers for you about the number of users that were using Android. So we had about 190 million active users of Android uh, with ice cream sandwich. Nexus phone, Galaxy Nexus, uh, nice phone. Now it's getting huge. Oh my gosh, that screen was so tall. It was what, four yeah. inches-ish? Again, all these things. If you go back in time, they're so small and cute. Um, 720p display, and we introduced NFC uh, and beam capability for the first time, which we've kept iterating on uh, since then. So things like pay and other capabilities um, as things could be integrated into. And our first phone without hollow buttons. Uh, okay, so here you're going to see there, there's a clock up in the up in the top. Keep your eye on the clock. That became another hobby of ours, changing the UX of the, the clock over time. Different fonts, different approaches to clocks. Um, we also finally moved on from analog. We realized it was probably difficult for people to tell the time. There is another clock here. You can barely see it on top of the default wallpaper. I don't know why that was the default setting. Uh, you had that clock on top of that wallpaper. You could not even see anything. Uh, and actually, at some point, we had clocks in so many places that you know, an internal joke become to, became to count how many times you could see the time on screen at once. The answer was always way too many. Uh, the source code was dropped. Uh, yeah, not 2011. No, 2011, yeah. Uh, a big change, the unification of our different media applications under the umbrella of Google Play. So we had uh, Android Market for the applications. We had books and videos and music. And they all became Google Play, and that's what you know today. Project Butter was about us realizing that there was probably a little too much jank in the system. It was too easy for uh, the user to see these stutters um, in 
a couple of different ways in animations when you're filling a list, but also in latency when the user touches the screen and then the visual impact of that touch comes on screen. So we started working hard on those aspects. I would say we never stopped since, but this was the first introduction to that. So major overhaul of how we were processing input and how we could speed that up, uh, as well as how we could do more and more hardware acceleration and techniques to speed up animations and, and uh, real-time display of information. We ship with one of my favorite devices ever, the Nexus 7. Uh, so yeah, like Chet said, there was a huge effort uh, to make uh, Android faster and smoother. We all, and it was not just in, in the system itself, it was also in developer tools, because that's when we introduced support for x86 in the emulator. Uh, we finally fixed that to-do uh, for, for bidirectional text, but that was only for text, that was not layouts. Shortly after, Android 4.2, still called Jelly Bean because we had run out of ideas. Uh, we had to ship a device with a massive display of 2560 by 1600. So if you own a 30 inch monitor uh, on your desk, that's the resolution of that monitor. Um, that's the tablet, no buttons anywhere. It was pretty cool. Uh, it was really hard to make everything run well because we were really constrained, constrained in terms of bandwidth. And actually, if you went to portraits, uh, things would start stuttering a little bit. Uh, I won't go into the details, but yeah, in Portrait, we had a little less bandwidth to work with, uh, so don't go to Portrait. Then we fixed the RTL uh, issue, so not only could we have it for text, but we could also have it for the overall layouts, which is just the right thing to do. Uh, and then in the next release, a bold move, so check out that clock. Who filed a bug because the hours was obviously a bug? Nobody would pick that design on purpose, right? I was working on the text renderer and I thought it was a bug in the font cache that we were picking the wrong font for that, for one of the numbers. We all filed bugs internally because obviously UX didn't intend this. No, they did, they did. I thought people really want to know the hours. Minutes, not so much. <laughs> Uh, quick settings, my first uh, idea when I saw this UI was to give me this, this brainstorm. I'm like, oh, now that it's arranged in this grid, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually edit those and pull some of those up to the top to be more important or move them off the screen? If there are some in a cache somewhere, I could pull them on. And I asked the manager of the team and he said, yeah, actually, uh, we have that mechanism underneath. Um, and in fact, it came to pass in the N release um, where quick settings and quick quick settings allow you uh, to actually edit these things on the fly. The software was actually there from the beginning. It's just that they didn't expose the capabilities in the UI or the APIs for doing it. That came along later. Meanwhile, in Waterloo, up in Canada, uh, BlackBerry 10 was released in 2013. Yeah, running on top of QNX. And in Palo Alto and Korea, LG acquires WebOS from HP. Hold that thought. So yeah, HP bought WebOS, then LG bought WebOS from HP. I think HP was just keeping it warm. <laughs> uh, Android Studio was released and Eclipse was deprecated. Um, so who's still using Eclipse? Good, good answer. <laughs> All right. Some people haven't gotten the memo yet. It takes a while to circulate. So, so still Jelly Bean because we were still running, we still didn't have any idea. Uh, it was just a continuation of Project Butter. We kept working on, on performance. And at that point we had 750 million active users of Android. So you can see that it, yeah, Android has taken off, had taken off and was not stopping. In Redmond and Espoo, uh, Espoo is a, a city near Helsinki. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I, I think it sounds cuter this way. Uh, Microsoft acquires Nokia's mobile division for $7.2 billion. Project Svelte was our attempt to finally get away from gingerbread, moderately successful, I would say. Uh, we realized that all of the capabilities we'd built into the platform had made it so large that it could not run along with other applications on more constrained devices. So there was an overt effort to actually reduce what we were doing uh, by default in the system image so that more could fit there and manufacturers could actually ship more limited devices on more recent releases. Um, notice the clock again, bug got fixed. We introduced uh, Art, the replacement for Dalvik. It was an opt-in, it was a developer setting, so Art was an ahead-of-time compiler, so not using a JIT, not using an interpreter, uh, and yeah, we fixed the hours. Uh, so this is an example of the kind of uh, stuff we did for performance and also for memory, so it's called batching and merging. We, we, because we record all the drawing operations, we can also reorder them as needed, so instead of drawing every draw call that you have in Canvas, 
Um, here's an example with settings where we can draw the entire UI in about five or six draw calls. You can see that all the text is drawn at the same time, uh, all the list dividers are drawn together, and that was made possible by the asset atlas. So when you boot the device, we take all the framework assets, we pack them into a single texture that we share with uh, all processes. So that saves about a meg or two per process, which is a huge saving when you're trying to kill gingerbread. Uh, and when I was working on that, I noticed this, uh, what I thought was a bug in my code. So if you look at the uh, progress bar animation here, you see those little gaps you know, uh, in the animation, and then a couple of gaps are missing. Uh, that was not a bug. Uh, well, at least not an engineering bug. Apparently, we had not designed the frames of the animation with the gaps. Assets are hard. Assets are hard. Uh, yeah, and, and it was bad because if you use that, that progress bar in your app, it would look like a stutter, and we thought, like, most of our apps were stuttering, and whenever we see that progress bar, it was not the app, it was the animation stutter. Not even stuttering, just skipping frames. Recycler View comes out in Support Library. This, again, was an important precedent where fundamental new capabilities that we wanted people to depend on were now not locked to platform releases, but were available uh, across many releases at the same time. So this came out as a utility library there. We've been doing more and more of that. Architecture components that came out recently is another good example of that. Like, we have such a robust platform already. Why do we build the APIs in there when we can just give people those APIs across previous releases as well? Meanwhile, back in Helsinki, Nokia ships the last Symbian-based phone. And material design is introduced as part of the Lollipop release. Uh, material design, this idea of ink and paper and multiple layers. Uh, the most important thing was that there was actual design system sort of behind all of the design decisions that we made on the platform, which gave applications as well as the OS and the system UI a very consistent approach. So we introduced, our art was turned on by default. We introduced a render thread. This was also the birth of Android TV and Android Auto. So Android was officially spreading to other platforms, not just tablets and phones anymore. Um, in material design, there are a lot of shadows. Some of you may, heard, may have heard that story before, but I was prototyping uh, the implementation and I thought, hey, why not retrace them on the GPU uh, like we would do offline? So this is the prototype application. You can see the shadows look beautiful. Uh, really it was nice. running at 60 FIPS on the Nexus 4. Uh, the small problem with that approach was that the device would start heating up and then get so hot that it would reboot after a couple minutes. So we figured we should maybe not ship that. Uh, so we did it differently. Runtime permissions were introduced in uh, the KLM Marshmallow, Marshmallow release. Uh, kind of painful to, for developers to go through, but much better for users. It was something that ideally we would have done from the start, um, but we needed to introduce it eventually to make the experience better. Uh, uh, skip. Yep, skipping. skipping you get uh, multi-window, Vulkan, AR, uh, or sorry, VR. Uh, yeah, Daydream is interesting because we used to have something called Daydream in the platform. Uh, that was actually the only cool name we had. Uh, you know, our browser used to be called Browser, the framework is called Framework, those are dumb names. Uh, but the screensavers were called Daydreams. Uh, that was an idea for, uh, by Dan Sandler, I yep. think. Uh, but the VR team decided that they really liked that name, so they took it away from us, and now the screensavers are called screensavers. I, I think their, their choice was either they had to find a new name or use Firebase. Um, so they took Daydream instead. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Helsinki, uh, in January, Nokia ships Nokia 6 running Android. And uh, Project Treble in uh, the O release, um, various things going into the O release, including Treble capabilities, speed up adoption by manufacturers by having low level APIs, bunch of text work, uh, downloadable fonts, fox, fonts in XML. Um, Launcher icons with multiple layers, make that richer. I did this slide especially for Roma. And I hate you for it. Uh, and lots of support library stuff coming out. As I said, we're introducing more and more in support library just because we can, unbundled with a release. Um, so brief factor, min SDK, uh, split bottom navigation view, all these things coming out there first. Physics animation part one. Uh, we bumped the min SDK even further. Um, and we'll continue to do so over time as it makes sense. New animation capabilities, uh, text capabilities introduced there. Meanwhile, back in Pleasanton, California, Chet acquires an LG television <laughs> running web OS for hundreds of dollars. So uh, now the question is what next? Obviously after O comes P, and nope, we're not gonna talk about it. Uh, it would be lovely if we have time for questions. We're already way over, so thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. <laughs>